Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. And I, I guess we're in conjunction with Sacred Garden Yoga because we had a very special episode today. How are you doing, Cindy? I'm good. How are you doing, Bryce? I'm so excited. It's been a crazy Mercury retrograde, like in all the best ways. The best, you know, I always say Mercury retrograde, it can be very, very stressful, you know, but uh, I feel like this Mercury retrograde has just been like miscommunication, uh, uh, problems with technology, Problem speaking, nothing major. So we're finally almost out of the woodwork. But um, speaking of, we have a workshop coming up at six. I'm so excited. Like this is, you guys, I, I nerd out on deep dives into weird dead people, like historic people. I like to gossip about like old kings and queens, but I also nerd out on spirituality and yoga. And, and so I am so excited about this workshop we're going to be doing at Sacred Garden. So where Cindy is um, called the Alchemy of Movement. And that's going to be on September 7th from 1 to 4 p.m. And we are going to have Zoom options available for those of you who cannot physically make it to the Shala. So where do you want to start, Cindy? Well, just to say that the Zoom option, I worked on it yesterday and it is available now. So if anyone who, who who's watching this, it is, uh, um, it is an option now. And awesome. anyone who wants to sign up virtually can do that. And I will send you, so for the people, so with this workshop, I have a manual slash workbook that I've, I've been, I, poor Cindy, I sent her a template like a couple months ago and now it's grown massively from, but I'm going to, I might have to actually start downsizing it a little bit, but for people who are come to the studio, you'll actually get a handout of this that you can take home, take notes in. Um, and for people who are doing it on the zoom option, I'll, I guess in the PDF of the workbook to send you to send to you guys, so you have the workbook um, with you at, at your house. And, um, you know, I, so, so that's basically the only difference is you're just, you're going to have me on, on, on camera, but not in person. So obviously there will be, you know, hands-on adjustment. Maybe one day Cindy will, will develop that city where we can actually reach through the zoom camera and like adjust somebody but i haven't developed that city yet city is a yoga power they talk about in the third and fourth pot i haven't developed that yet. i don't know how anybody who has developed that city yet but maybe one day who knows we can just stick our stick our hand right through the zoom and just adjust somebody. you never know your screen becomes a portal I know, right right um i mean hell people can levitate why not you know so so <laughs> and i do i told cindy before we started filming i want to kind of start off you know, even though this workshop that we're doing is highly based in the physical, um, I want to make it very clear before we get into any discussions about that, that this is for all levels. If you have a body, you're able to come. Um, I don't care if you're 500 pounds. I don't care if you're a marathon runner. I don't care if you can touch your toes or if you can hardly bend over to touch your knees. We all have to start somewhere. It doesn't matter. And we're not looking for, for perfection we're, even though we're going to be talking about the intensity of exercise being kind of the foundation of spirituality, intensity is relative. You know, it depends mm -hmm. on like Cindy's fitness level is not going to be a beginner's fitness level. You, you can't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10. And as teachers, I know I, I think I can speak for Cindy when I say this. We're not judging your fitness level. We're going to be teaching each student to where they are in that moment. And that moment is always changing. And I say this all the time, Cindy, 
and I mean it when I say it, there are a lot of flexible assholes in this world. And there are also a lot of really nasty people who have very beautiful practices. So your value, I want to make that very, very clear for people who perhaps want to take this workshop, but maybe feel a little intimidated. You have nothing to be intimidated. I am just happy you're there. Cindy is happy you're there. Your, your, um, your, your willingness to do this discipline is what's inspiring. And if you want to be an inspira a deeper inspiration, just be a good person, you know? And so I really want people to understand. And we have such an incredible student body at Sacred Body. Uh, sac sacred Body. It's Mercury Retrograde. Sacred Garden, don't we, Cindy? Like, we have some of the best students in the world. Absolutely. And they're very welcoming and very kind. And we're all doing our work. And so I think we respect each other in that. And that whatever level at the work that you're in we're just here holding space for each other to do that work together so you don't have to like do it all by yourself that's the one nice thing about having a group practice um, especially coming into a space if that's available to you is that group energy definitely makes a difference that community feeling of knowing that we're all working through this and i'm not the only one who has my my crap everyone else has theirs too and you don't feel alone <laughs> no in the, in the process and i'm telling you cindy you can probably uh when you're teaching you get a very different perspective of what's happening in the room than when you're practicing in the room and every single person at least one at one point in the practice or multiple points in the practice looks angry looks pissed off looks like they're struggling so it's very normal in fact that's part of it is experiencing friction right and so everybody is experiencing and you're right there is something very special about the prana which means energy basically upward rising, like high in, in, in upward rising or high intensity, uh, high intensity energy, sweat, you know, um, is that when there's more people in the room, there's more energy in the room. And so some mm -hmm. so, so that, that, that thing you fear, like if you're intimidated to come into a room, cause there's going to be more, it's actually going to be benefit beneficial to you. It creates a, a magic almost in the room that kind of carries you with it and supports you. And it's, it's a lot, easier to teach a pack class and easier to practice in a pack class versus uh, not as many people because there's a different energy feel and so please don't and please know that the, the students at sacred garden are really happy when they see new students come in they're welcoming mm -hmm. they're happy to see you you know they're mm -hmm. glad you're right. here you know so don't feel intimidated at all um it's it's i, I really want to encourage and if anybody has any questions about that if you're still feeling a little bit nervous you can always reach out to me and i'm sure cindy would be happy to talk to you as well it's it's nothing to worry about and if you want you can sit in the back of the room it's no big deal right um and so i guess with that being said cindy i guess we should talk about friction and the body and um exercise well what is it i'm just curious too um, with your workshop, I mean, yeah, I've read through some of the descriptions and everything, but what would you say is the main takeaway that you want people to have after doing your workshop? I think my, the main takeaway I want people to have is that being here on this earth, it's, I said this before in class, I don't think the word human should be a noun. I think it should be a verb. You know, you and I've, I've quoted the Emerald Tablets before. One of the most, there's so many profound things. And we're going to be looking through some other, we're not just going to be looking at the Yoga Sutras, but we're going to be looking at other ancient scriptures as well, because they're all kind of saying the same thing in their own unique way. Both in the Emerald Tablets, the, the profound thing that I really was like, wow, that's, that's deep. He makes a statement that when you are in spirit, when you're not in a body or an incarnation, you don't know life you don't know life because you don't know death because the spirit never dies and so part of the beauty of being a human being is that we're in mortality and we're in these bodies and these bodies are we're in mortal spirits that are existing in mortal bodies and that does create an opposing force and creates some suffering and confusion which is part of the journey but I think that when I, you know, I think what was profound about when I read that is I obviously I'd already gone through over a decade. You know, this was just a few years ago. I've been now I'm like 18 years in now. And 
I think I really understood what he was saying. Because when we come into this, this body, we're coming into a nervous system. We're coming into emotions. And as the law of one states, which is another template we're going to pull from, is that the soul has come here to refine itself. And, you know, my, my teacher in India talks about when you clean gold, you boil it so you can wipe the impurities away. And so when we come into a body, and I you know the Western world too, we really like separated the spirit and the body, but they're actually one and the same because the body is a living expression of the spirit. And so within your muscles, within your fascia, you carry all this information and not just information dealing with shadow work, which is a part of it. That's why exercise is the root word of exorcism. I mean, how obvious is that? You're literally exercising your own demons. Um, you know, Catholic Church really got literal with that, you guys. Um, but um, but you're also learning how to to use your consciousness in a different way. And I think, you know, sometimes in the modern day spiritual world, we see a lot of disassociation where people try to escape being human. And I can't help but think that that's going to just create more karma, you know, because you actually came here to face mortality. It was it Richard Freeman said, famous Ashtanga teacher said, you know, actually your yoga practice is really just preparing you for death to face your mortality. And, and, and in that, since things are fleeting, and experiences aren't permanent, then there is creation in life. And I, you said something profound in one episode, Cindy, where, you know, we drop down into the lower three chakras, which are really going to be where we're focusing a lot in this, in this workshop. And, you know, the, the middle of the three, for those who aren't familiar, is it's orange. And people think it's sexuality, which it is, but it's actually also creativity and creation. So mm -hmm. that matches what Thoth said, right? Because creation only comes with life. And so you are, can only really create when you're in body, not out of it. And so that's why it's partially down here in this area, because that's part of your, your humanness. It's not part of your spirit. It's part of your humanness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're wanting people to tap into that part of themselves so that they can free up, too. I mean, the way yeah. I see it and the, the, the way I like to explain it, too, is like freeing up some of the where your energy is being used up in fear and anxiety and all these other modes because it's all creative energy right and just as you are there's one saying that i like is you know we are we are free like we have free will yeah. that's one of the um actually attributes of the supreme is a spatantria is the word for it, is that we are free to do whatever it is that we want to do and we are so free that we are free we are free enough to create our own bondage. We're yeah. so free that we are free to create our own pain, our own suffering, our own bondage. And so, you know, it, see if, if all your energy is going into creating that old story, that like this karmic story, this karmic loop that you've made up for yourself based off of all the old programmings that came from fear and suffering and all those you know, past experiences that we have, then you're gonna continue to create a life that comes from that space. That's actually in the Yoga Sutras, as a matter of fact. Um, I think in Yoga Sutra 2.12 to 2.14, Patanjali goes into his definition of karma. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how he defines karma is however you show up in the world, whatever energy that you put into the world, then you're going to receive that, ex that exact match, which is how, you know, the when it creates that kind of karmic looping. So if you're always putting out fear and anxiety, you're going to get fear and anxiety back. That's in a nutshell what the karma suit or for what the, uh, what not the karma sutras for the yoga sutras say. Mercury retrograde to karma. That's another, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, it, and, and in our practice, we're trying to free ourselves, like free it from the body where our creative energy is going to and free it from the fears, free it from an old story and stick it from the past to shed those old skins so that we can then create a, a new story based off of viewing from that Purusha, right? From the witness, yeah. from the soul. Yeah. And, but it all had to happen um, through the body. And we can't do that. Like we, we can't do that unless we do 
we get in by, we realize that our power is here, that this is the most potent instrument that we have is the physical body itself. And something that we were talking about in class today, we were saying that because just going off of what you were talking about escapism, one of the reasons we like to escape the body is because we don't feel safe in our bodies. We think of our body as like this, um, it's like ter it's a uh, threatening territory. Like our, our body feels threatening or doesn't feel safe. It feels like the enemy zone <laughs> yeah. when in fact, that's not true, but maybe we felt that way in the past because whenever we've been in body as children, it, we, we felt a lot of pain, you know, in the relationships that we were in, they didn't work out or, you know, we were hurt and all these other things. And so we decided at some point that the body was not a safe place to inhabit. And so we escape, you know, we go outward and then we, in, in the energy of anxiety and stress and fear is also upward and outward as well. And so then all your energy is going into this escapism. And the first step is to be able to reaffirm that, oh, no, you know, my body is actually not a, um, uh, a place that I should be afraid of. My body can, can be a sanctuary. Yeah. It can be a sanctuary for my soul to land and retraining ourselves into believing that. It, it kind of goes to what you were saying at the um, before we were before we came in. You were talking about how exercise is sometimes demonized, or we don't like to exercise. We don't like to do the things that that bring us back into our body, and that could be part of it. That could be some of the resistance that we get from uh, anything, any kind of practices that makes us come down into ground, mm -hmm. because then suddenly we have to uh, face the stuff that's in the body. So part of the work is clearing the crud, undoing the programs so that we can feel like the body is a safe place to land. And we can we can feel it as our sanctuary, our home, a place that nurtures us, nurtures us, a place that feeds us and that our body is the it's the most powerful instrument that we own because everything that creative force has to go through there. So instead of then, you know, Instead of then with that kind of self-awareness, instead of then creating from your pain and your suffering, you can create from a place of feeling grounded and safe and fulfilled and satisfied. And then you'll get totally different results in life. And that is so important. And that is absolutely the crux of what I was telling you. Like one of the most, one of the big things that I want, especially for the Western world, and this is part of my own you know, I grew I was born in the 80s. And so for us 80s babies, especially the early 80s or late 70s, people who were in the 70s, the 80s were that was the age of Jazzercise and Jenny Craig. And I think Jazzercise is great. Now looking at it, I think a lot of our mothers and our friends would do these workout programs to lose weight. And yes, losing weight is a wonderful thing if you need to for your body for your health. But if you're using exercise as a way to fit a mold that you don't if if you don't already think you're worthy and you're using exercise to validate you to be worthy, to have other people's approval, then it becomes a punishment. And we are, or we go into arenas of like eating disorders where there's a, a binge disorder where people over exercise. And when I say over exercise for that, that's going to be different again for different people, right? A beginner is not going to over exercise. What Cindy and I do on a daily basis would probably be, be considered over exercising for a beginner, right? So that I don't want to make that very clear. That's very relative to a person. And, you know, I'm someone when I got into my twenties, I mean, I was probably when I, when I first lived out after school, lived in Los Angeles, I weighed like 106 pounds. Like I was, but I was in Los Angeles and I had grown up with a mother who was always dieting. And so I would go on these like long ass runs because I needed to, so that I could be, I mean, I was buying Spanx in a time in my life that I didn't need Spanx. So I had a very warped, very dysmorphic view of my body. And I thought my body was punishing me. I, I was very critical of my body. If it didn't look like this or didn't look like that, I look back at those pictures now. I'm like, I don't know what I worried about, but I think a lot of women and some men have that relationship with their body that they they're mean to it. And of course we know mm -hmm. one of the, the first rule of yoga is a hemza nonviolence. And the most important aspect of that is not being violent with yourself. 
And so it took, I don't know when the epiphany hit me, but as I started to transition from long distance running into yoga and then into traditional yoga, I don't know when I actually started to change my perspective. I think it actually kind of changed over time until one day, all of a sudden I realized, oh wait, I've been, now I'm thinking about my body differently. And that burning sensation, you know, we get into these, whatever exercise it is, where you're in a your deep muscle burn, more of an anaerobic you know, place where the muscles are on fire and we immediately want to escape it. But all of a sudden you start to go, wait a minute, what happens if I stay? What can my body do now? What's that, that you become interested in your body. You become like, almost like you're dating your body. You know, you're like, what, let me, what can I discover more about in my body? Um, you know, and, and like, as Ram, I always think of the Ram Dass quote where he's like, everything's just interesting all of a sudden. And there's also a very, you know, I liked how you talked about that bondage. Marnie Alton said that in a class once. She talked about how we build this cage around us. We build this cage and we think we're stuck or we think we're stuck in these limitations. And the more you change your perspective, all of a sudden one day you wake up and you realize the door to that cage wasn't even locked. And I just love that, that because when you do start to feel stronger, when you do start to, you know, it, it, let's take running, for example, if you decide you're in one day or one month, one mile seems like it's horrific. And then like three months, you're running five miles. And all of a sudden you, you busted through your own perceived limitations. You start to then tap in to that boundless energy, that limitless energy that's actually inside of you. And you've been the one suppressing it all this time. And it becomes such a magical thing. And I, I even, I think I wrote it on Instagram, you know, the initiate's path. We talked about this in class this morning, something the Emerald Tab Tablets talk about as well as the law of one. Um, the initiate's path is not an easy one. In a lot of ways, when you step onto an initiate's path, whatever form of spirituality, your karma speeds up. And so the universe is going to put the, all of a sudden things kind of start falling apart, right? before they have to, before they rebuild in your life. And it's sometimes it's the universe, like pushing you, giving you that little bit more resistance. Um, but when you find yourself really grounded within yourself, whatever chaos is happening around you, you're able to be able to face it differently and, and, and be more at peace with the stages of your life. If that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. It's, um, in the, the tantric philosophy, we say that you go through your body for enlightenment. You don't necessarily try to bypass, which is, you know, maybe some of the traditional or some of the more classical teachings will say, well, the body is something that we need to escape from, or, or the body causes pain and it causes suffering. It causes all these things. It's you know, that's where all the, the friction and all this stuff comes from. And if we put too much attention on the body, too much attention to our desires and too much attention on, you know, on the five senses and all these things that uh, we can get um, distracted, which is true. I mean, there is that element of distraction that can happen when we get too much uh, focus on that we're nothing but the body. So there's a fine balance. I mean, we are the body, but we're also more than the body. But that doesn't mean that you ignore what the what the possibilities and, and what is, um, yeah, like what truly is possible if we start to go through the body to find our spirituality or our ascension, if we want to ascend or if we want to, um, you know, become more enlightened. It's a descension process. First, we descend down into our humanity first and so that then we can ascend and rise up into our spirituality. So we go through the body. The body is actually seen as something that is supreme. It's not something that, get, it, that gets in the way. It's seen as an instrument of God. It's an instrument of the divine itself. And you use the body to, uh, to ascend or to you know, reach that state of more self-awareness or higher consciousness or whatever terms are, you know, to become closer to the spirit or to become closer to God, whatever those words are for you. But there is a fine line though there. Uh, we we are a spirit too, and we can't forget that because then if you get, get get too caught up and anchored in the body and that debauchery and all that stuff <laughs> starts to come in, that's when the yogis get in trouble. You know, all <laughs> those things, like all the, the things that you hear about the yogis just going off track because they... They took 
they yeah. took the um, they took the the worldly experience too seriously. So it's like we have to find that that way balance. that balance of appreciating both that we are both spirit and we are both body. It's um, well, that's even when I'm doing like my own. And I always tell, I'm always make sure every student knows everything I ask you to do, I do on myself as well. So I'm not someone that's just telling you to do something. And you know, I have my own little ballet bar now, and I'll be up on the balls of my feet in a deep, like bend, squeezing a block or a ball, and I'll feel that fiery sensation. And I always ask first, I say, what, what can I, I need to go into that fiery. And this is the conversation I'm having with myself. And part of my mind is negotiating, trying to negotiate like, oh, you should go do the laundry right now. You know, just <laughs> right in that moment, you should go do the laundry. Your mind will play all sorts of tricks on you. Um, but, you know, I, I, and I, in that instant of like feel, going into that burn, I'll also say, what do you have to teach me right now about this life? Because it's about it, it is about experiencing the world around you, being in with being in the instrument that also experiences the world. And um, you know, my boyfriend says this a lot about the a lot of you see that that imbalance sometimes in the Ashtanga world where the people will take the Ashtanga practice a little too seriously to the point where mm -hmm. that's literally they won't they won't do anything that's gonna like their that becomes their life. And my boyfriend will say, it's not supposed to be your life. It's supposed to enhance your life, mm -hmm. you know? And I've had students even ask me, like I've had, especially down at AYA, they'll be like, you know, I run too, but I'm thinking I should give up running because I, I don't want it, my hand, you know, my hamstrings. And I always, you know, what should I do? And I always, I always say to them, well, do you, do you enjoy running? Well, yeah. Well, then why would you give it up? Because that's part of mm -hmm. something, that's part of your experience, you know? So I get what you're saying where people take it a little too, it's, um, it helps you, you know, I, I love that. I think the be best metaphor is a lot of people who especially have really intense jobs. Like we have a lot of um, lawyers, you know, that have really crazy jobs and they use their time at Sacred Garden to help get their mind right so that they can go be the best lawyer they can be, right? Mm -hmm. They can be very much involved in their dharma and, and um, taking that moment when you're not at work or in practice to be in the park and to like really feel the grass and just to be, and I think for me, especially with the, with my journey and my own body, learning to appreciate it and learning to be present with it, it helps me be present with everything else, with mm -hmm. everything else to really feel. And so that, um, it just brings me to another uh, question for you, if you don't mind me asking, because I like to use the word um, alchemy a lot, you know, some of my programs, um, yeah you know, contain the word alchemy. So when you say in your, because it's the title of your workshop, that alchemy of movement, where, where's the alchemy happening there? The tra Well, an alchemist for the, our people traditionally is someone that turns lead into gold, right? It's like a magician. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of think more about it, like, you know, in, in the in thoughts and roll tablets, everything's the magic of this, the magic of that. And what you learn when you're reading it is when he says magic, he means you. He's talking about you. He's not talking about like hocus pocus. Like he's talking about you and your transference inside of you, in your soul, in your journey on this initiate's path of, of, be, of, of choosing. And that's something that's super powerful, at least in my belief system, is that our souls made the conscious choice to come into these bodies. And when we recognize that, we stop. I think having a pity party, we realize how powerful that is, that I made a choice to do this. That's because there's power there and my soul took that. And so my job now being in body and having this mind is to actually turn the dead knowledge, the, the deadness, the heaviness, that bondage and create release that energy and turn it into that gold, if that makes sense, metaphorically within myself, trans tr transforming myself um, into whatever the refinement that my soul, my soul, whatever, for whatever reason, my soul decided that for whatever refinement I needed was to be a white girl in Georgia who was going <laughs> to go off to India and do all these crazy things. And that's what, and so I'm going to embrace that because there was some, there was obviously something there that was still weighing my soul down that needed to be changed into gold. And I quote Cindy all the time. Like Cindy always says, she don't want to leave this world with any more karma. She just mm -hmm. <laughs> she wants to drop some off, you know? And so that's kind of what I mean is that you are magic. 
And I feel like yeah, and then our our exercise, our practices, and our exercises like the crucible, yeah, from which the alchemy gets the heat. Because you know, most uh, when you're talking about alchemy, you usually need some kind of you know go, coming back to your idea of friction and uh, needing heat, um, so that that process, that transformation, can begin to happen. So you know, movement is one way to do that. And um, meditation is another way to do that. There's many, there's many ways, many ways to produce that, that sense or that feeling of the alchemy within yourself. And, you know, at the end, you know, the, at the end of the, the alchemy is the um, philosopher's stone, right? That's what they want at the end, which is that most purified state. And Carl Jung actually has his four steps of alchemy that had to know the psychological out al the alchemy that we go through, where we have to go through the processes of the the blackening, <laughs> which is the hard, you know, that's the hard part when 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 you have to pull the crud out. Mm -hmm. you know, when you put you you pull it out because you got to you, the alchemy is a purification process. And before you can purify, you gotta like, you know, pull the stuff yeah, out. It can it. feel yeah. yucky and it can feel cruddy and all that and you know he called that like the negredo stage the blackening stage before the purifying stage can happening the blackening has to happen too and so those are the you know all the stages that we go through i think you know when we start a practice when we whether you know it's a physical movement practice so all the stiffness all the tightness all the the stories that's that's in your dna structure it's 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 in your framework. Those old stories are in your framework. You have to make them conscious. Yeah. You have to pull them out from the subconscious realm and make them conscious so that you can actually see them. And that's kind of like that blackening, which can also at times feel like that dark night of the soul when every, all your stuff comes up where it's, you know, it's just uncomfortable to face it, but it's, you know, at times it's a necessary part so that we can actually look at and see it. And then, then the, the, you know, the, the clearing, processes can begin to happen from there absolutely the philosopher's stone can be refined yeah and that's part of it too like i want every student because the two classes i teach are hard classes I, I i teach high intensity forms of of movement of, of exercise um for those who are new to this i mean that's what it is that's what yoga is it's, it's different forms of exercise and Part of what I see in the Ashtanga world, I've seen with myself, with all the students. I mean, Cindy, if you had to guess how many people you put your hands on, I know that sounds bad, but like as a teacher, I mean, it's in the thousands, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the bodies you've seen move. And the common denominator is that most people do not think that they are as strong as they actually are. Now, there's that small mm -hmm. percentage that think they're stronger than they actually are. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a different, that's a totally different type of dark night of the soul for those people. But part of, you know, and with Ashtanga, there's a lot of tough love. And it's because teachers have to kind of put you in that position to kind of push you over to show you so that you take this, you see for yourself that you are so much, you need, it's that magic. And I want people I was laughing with the class this morning because I was so sore and I was laughing with our class because I was sore and I was like, guys, it just never ends. Like it's always, you're constantly in this, this fluctuation. Right. And, but still with that being said, I was excited to move because there's new discoveries to be made. And that's what my hope is. Like I, it breaks my heart when I think people are nervous because they're embarrassed because they're out of shape or they don't think that they're, you know, this is not we're not a this isn't sports sports there's there there can be spiritual discoveries in sports too don't get me wrong anytime you the body there can be these these subtle discoveries this is a school a mystery school a shala this is a place where you come to learn about yourself and you have somebody you know it's it's i think i we laugh with, i say this a lot cindy you know the teacher's job is to eventually not be needed that's the difference between a teacher and a cult leader is like i think as teachers we want students to have autonomy we want students to and that's my goal. I want people coming to this workshop to walk away from this workshop, having a renewed sense of, of power and of, of groundedness and be excited. Whether in this workshop to you guys, again, uh, Cindy, my focus is like yoga and dance. I mean, Cindy's a dance, she's a ballerina too. But, um, but you know, 
world, I, I would love to have runners. I follow running pages because listen, if you're running for health or weight loss, you only need to do like three miles to do that. I love following marathon runners because why are they running 26 point? Mm -hmm. there's something else there there's something else going on and that's uh, to me in my opinion that's alchemy and that's a form of their own spiritual development is is doing that and breaking that limitation and you know it, it's um it's also uh david Grieg. i, I brought this story up a lot because he was one of my original teachers up in philadelphia he's one of the, the big ashtanga teachers and i'm so grateful that i had him because honestly i learned so much about myself just watching him teach and he would get you know he would have these young like 22 year old girls come in who had been cheerleaders or dancers and so the skill level was they would move pretty quickly through the series he'd be like okay next posture next posture whatever but when like a 60 70 year old man would come in who was like overweight and could barely touch his toes david would get so excited and he would always say, okay, now we have something to work with. And that really, I think sometimes when we feel these limits, we all have limitations. We all have like our perceived limitations. We all have tightness. We all have weaknesses in the body. Not one human being on this earth has just a perfect, painless body, right? And watching David teach to that, or when something was really tight in a, in a student that was having a hard time budging, he would get excited. Because there was resistance there. And because there was resistance, we had something to work with. You know, if you have nothing mm -hmm. to work with, what's the point? And that changed my perspective completely. And that's another, I want our students and our friends who come to this workshop, every part of their body or their physicality that they are afraid of because it's weak or it's not flexible or it's embarrassing because maybe it's a little bit overweight or soft. I want people to look at that as a gift because it's something to work with and there's information there, right? And that's another, so, so the, the way they come to their mat or their go put their running shoes on or put their ballet shoes on, they can actually ha be more inspired to face the difficult stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the the yoga practice is in a way designed to do that is to create uncomfortable situations. So that when you have uh, real life uncomfortable situations, you have strategy and you're built into your system already, it's built into your nervous system. This is how I'm going to respond when something hard comes, uh, comes, comes along, because you know, something will eventually and you have a response that you've built in to your body through your practice and how, you know, to, to remain more non-attached, which mm -hmm. I think is a difficult, really difficult thing, but, and that to train your nervous system to not go crazy um, so that you can get through your challenge, whatever challenge it is with more clarity and you don't stay in that downward spiral if there happens to be one for as long you can uh, spiral yourself back up. Um, in other words, it, 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 you get a system, you train your body, you train your system to learn how to deal with challenging situations and change. Because, mm -hmm. you know, most challenging situations, uh, the root of it is change in the first place. And, and it gives you, gives you a way. I mean, that's what the sutra is, is all about. It's, it's a way, it's a pathway. Yeah, you know, he said, do these things. If you do these things and you'll be able to move through your life with more grace yep. and with more ease, but you got to train yourself to do that. Just like with any, anything. Uh, um, so aspects of your self-awareness, your, your growth, um, your spiritual awakening, um, it's a training process. Um, most people are not going to be born that way. Well, they, you know, you might be slightly born that way, but then, the things happen in our life and we get concealed. Um, How boring the, would that the fears, be? The, the concealment happens. And then in that concealment, we have to learn how to, and that's, you know, that's where all the, the fear, the anxiety, the, the bad choices, the fear of change and all those things come from. And so you have to train, like your, your spiritual, your personal growth is a, is a training, just like you train for a marathon. Yeah. Or, you know, a ballerina trains to be a ballerina or a great artist trains to be an artist. 
you're not just going to wake up one day enlightened for 99% of the population. Yeah. <laughs> when you, uh, you, you, train, you have to train yourself. And that's what this is, is, you know, through yoga or these workshops and anything, it's a training for you for life. I yeah. mean, it's like a training for you to deal with life. It's, it's how boring would it be if we came in here enlightened? That would just be so boring. It's like you you have nothing to work with at that point. Like you got nothing to work with. You're just, it's, it's, and, and the progress internally that is, 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 is felt is it me, you know, I say a lot in Ashtanga because Ashtanga, it, it looks from the outside. It's very contortionist, but I always say like, Ashtanga teachers are never going to ask you to get more flexible because flexibility is fleeting, especially for women. It, you know, it's very hormonal based, but you're always going to hear teachers tell you to get stronger. And there's something very mental and emotional about that. It's like the stronger your body physically starts to get, the stronger your mind starts to get, the stronger your mm -hmm. emotions start to get. And I was watching the other day, there is, um, cause I love watching these, um, documentaries about athletes. And I have a, a friend who's an Olympic gold medalist. And I've asked her a lot about these spiritual questions. Like what, what realizations have when you train as an athlete, you're putting a lot of energy into your body and you're really getting in touch with those subtle bodies. So what, what can I, what can I learn from you? And I watched the Simone Biles documentary on Netflix and you know, we're not gymnastic, we're not gymnasts in, in yoga. And actually gymnastics and yoga is, is very different. Um, you know, you can see it in the bodies, the way the body responds to it. But there's something, I thought this was so fascinating. This just really was fascinating to me. She, there's, she suffered with something in the Tokyo Olympics called the twisties. This mm -hmm. was so, and what happens, this is common in gymnastics. Now with gymnastics, when this happens, it's dangerous because you could actually kill yourself because it, you'll be like up in a, you know, jumping from bar to bar and it, your mind has set that pattern to create that shape. But in the middle of doing that, the mind and the body will disconnect and the body will mm -hmm. do something completely different than what the mind is telling it to do. And that's what happened to her. And, and what can happen is like, you could fall and hit your head and that's why it's very dangerous. So usually when a gymnast suffers from that, that's why she pulled out of the Tokyo Olympics was because something mm -hmm. was going on and we need to, because we cannot put you back up. But I thought, how spiritual is that? Now, after that happened, guys, y'all remember what happened soon after that, the expose that happened with the doctor who was, I don't know what I can say on YouTube, but manhandling will say these young girls inappropriately. Mm. They all had suppressed it and suppressed it and suppressed it. So using that as an extreme example, because stuff like that, like we will just, we'll have that in yoga, but it's not dangerous. It, you, you know, it's not like you're in the middle of the air, like flipping, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's, but your body one of the most amazing things about your body is it will only hold things for so long. Mm -hmm. You are forced to deal with it. There's no getting out of this scot free. Well, yeah, your body is, it's not designed to hold fear and pain. I mean, it can hold it there for a minute, but it won't hold it for long or it won't hold it forever without it wreaking havoc on you at some point or another, like whatever happened to some Simone Biles or what happens to us when we get anxiety attacks or we get depression or, you know, something happens physically, we get bad migraines that are unexplainable or we get these weird things that start happening in our bodies that you go to the doctor and they do all the x-rays and all the scans and they can't figure out what's going on. Because your body is not designed to hold fear and pain. Now, your body can process fear and pain. Yeah, It's really good at processing that because your body's really good at processing. Even if you think about it, the physical uh, process, how it detoxifies. You know, you got kidneys, you got liver, you got all this stuff. You got an immune system that helps to, you know, to fight off um, yucky stuff and the cultures, everything else. So your body is is designed to process things but it's not designed like if you used to think about it physically it's not designed just to hold on to stuff i mean that's why you have a digestive system yep. so it processes and it and it gets the nutrients in and then it <laughs> eliminates everything else and you know the reason that you have yep. an immune system and everything so if you even think about the physical body the physiological body it doesn't hold on to stuff you know it's it processes thing everything is moving 
your circulatory system is moving. And if something ever grows stagnant and quits moving, then that's probably a very bad, uh, bad thing that, you know, disease is probably on its way because the circulatory system is supposed to move. Your lymph system is supposed to move. You know, there's always a pulsating, the heart pulsates. If your heart stops beating, obviously that's very bad. So everything in your body, and when you eat, yeah, when you eat the the body, the food doesn't stay in your body. It it eliminates it. So your body is designed to process and to move things. It's okay. not designed to hold on to things. And so then you can take that just even with your thoughts and your beliefs and the, the things that we stuff down. If you if it holds on, it's going to cause a breakdown in the body, or it's going to cause something to happen because it's not built for that. It's built to I'll, I'll process it for you just like you got fear you got anxiety i'll help you process it you know bring it on we'll process it, let it through, go. The, through the central nervous system i'll help you process the fear i'll help you process the grief yeah you know, it, it'll help you process that stuff but um once you, you you get into the energy of no i want to hold on to this i'm not ready to let go it will it will only do that for so long before it starts to spit things out in in ways that are not <laughs> not great <laughs> well, you could be in the moment the olympics and almost break your neck yeah it's um, <laughs> exactly right it, it, and most of us and i'm laughing about because i'm watching this and i'm thinking god most of us do this don't we we wait to the point where it get the red flags are there but we just keep pushing it down until it can't the body just goes nope we're not doing this anymore and you know you think about it like if you were to go you know the story about forrest gump where he's running for days well that can't happen because eventually the body it can't you're right it can't keep doing the same thing forever it's going to stop it's going to shut down you know, um, it's, it's, um, it's a rolling stone gathers no moss, right? It's, it's intention is to keep moving through stuff. And, um, with her, you know, it was like the perfect storm because she had the pressure of the Olympics, all this stuff going on and it created the perfect crack in her psyche. But that crack was what needed to happen. So it goes back to that David Greek thing of now she had something to work with. Now mm -hmm. that happened. it happened. We saw it happen on camera. You see it happen. And immediately she's pulled out because they at least in the gymnast world they know they're smart enough that something's going on in the sub and usually it is kind of the subconscious mind because the conscious mind is like i gotta do this i gotta finish this yoga class and i gotta go home and feed the kids and i gotta go home and pay the bills and i gotta get ready for that presentation at work tomorrow that's the conscious mind the subconscious mind is going oh my God, I've been traumatized since I was five and I keep trying to like push this up for you to look at, but you keep pushing it back down and eventually it's just gonna, it's just gonna have to just be dropped. And that might be in the middle of the Tokyo Olympics. It might be in the middle of a sun salutation in the yoga room. And the thing is like, if you, I really encourage you guys to watch this documentary, especially if you're interested in this kind of stuff, because it took a while for them to figure out why that had happened. It was just coincidental that we started to see all these other things come out at the same time. And she she talks about she was driving and all of a sudden she called the news report came out and she pulled her car over and called her mom and her mom picked up and all she could hear was her just releasing these tears. And it gives me chill bumps in the car. So just hearing that news mm -hmm. report unlocked this grief and this shame that had happened to her since she was a kid. The parents didn't know, you know, the kids didn't know at that time what was going on. It just didn't feel right, you know? And one thing that was interesting too in this documentary is that after she'd gone through the therapy and everything she needed to deal with her mind, and then she started going back to the gym to train in gymnastics because everyone thought she was just going to retire at that point. I love a good comeback story. Um, when mm -hmm. she got back to the gym, she went straight back to the beginning. This was Simone mm -hmm. Biles, the most decorated gymnast in the world, doing foundational stuff for a while. All she did was foundational stuff. And I was sitting there thinking, well, isn't that interesting? Cause we do the same thing in yoga. Mm -hmm. Especially Ashtanga. You could be practicing a third series practitioner or a fourth series practitioner. And if you're going through a divorce or if you're moving or if you've just traveled, guess what? You're doing primary series for a while. You go, you go back to the foundations. Mm -hmm. You set everything. It's a reset, right? And of course, with her too, with, with gymnastics, it's to make sure that her mind, so she's not going to have a twist, not going to kill, you know, she, they want to make sure her, she's able to do this and her mind and body are connected. But I thought this is so fascinating because this is, this is how this, this is how this happens. We're not escape. We don't, we don't get a, we don't get exempt 
from this, these experiences as human beings. That's part of why, that's why I want us to see we're humaning, we're humaning. And this is part of the experience. And again, everything that comes up that's uncomfortable, there's, there's information there, there's potency there. You know, it's like, I, I've, I've laughed about this before. So primary, when I first started learning Ashtanga Yoga, primary series came pretty quickly to me because I, I am lanky. So the binds were, you know, we're not, I'm not going to lie. That does make the binds easier when your arms are long, right? Um, and I'm really good at like forward folding and hip stuff. That, but backbending, oh, that's where. So I went through primary series pretty smoothly. And then I got to second series. I've injured my, I injured myself like three times in second, second series. I punched a teacher coming out of a deep back bend in second series. And I literally wanted to run from second series and just do primary. But through those experiences, I actually had, I was forced. If I wanted to stay in this practice, I had to figure out a way to integrate second series into my system. And that's when I started realizing the breath connects to the paranervous system. If I can just breathe properly in the back bend, I can actually be present in that back bend. And that's something that I think Patanj around about way Patanjali kind of points out as well is when I'm in primary series, my mind, I'm thinking about that cute boy I saw or that mm -hmm. great dinner I had the other, that great movie I want to see, or what am I going to do after this? So my, I'm not presently there because it's, it's easy. There's nothing, there's no wisdom in what I'm, what I can already do. But when I would get to, when I do second series, my mind wasn't anywhere but my body. I was totally present in that moment because there was panic there, because there was discomfort and that that was a gift. And if I can- You were in the crucible. That was your- yeah. Yeah, it's like you had to put yourself in the crucible to yeah. alchemize. Out, yeah, and it was a controlled. Um, that's what Catherine Edwards said once. It's like you're, you're voluntarily putting yourself into a controlled destruction. So it's not like mm -hmm. you're, I, I, hope, I don't want people to go out and like put themselves in abusive, abusive relationship. No, like you are in, and that's the beautiful mm -hmm. thing about the yoga room is that you have a teacher in there. And our first and foremost, our priority is to make sure you're safe, that you're not going to hurt yourself. Obviously, we talked about this on Sunday. Sometimes there's a karmic reason and sometimes an injury will happen because that's a comp karmic reason. But our pri priority is to make sure when I'm scanning the room to adjust, I don't know about you, Cindy, but for me, when I'm scanning the room to adjust, the first thing I'm looking for is anybody about to hurt themselves. And that's mm -hmm. the first thing I go to immediately. That's the, as David agree, <laughs> in busy rooms, busy mice rooms, he'd be adjusting one person. He'd look through and he'd see somebody, he'd be like, John, emergency, emergency, stop. He would just yell emergency. <laughs> and oh you, my gosh. You know, when he yelled emergency, he meant like, you're about to hurt yourself, dude. Yeah. Like, you're about to fall <laughs> yeah. like this, we're not even going to talk about aligning your spine. Like this, like your knee's about to pop out of us. <laughs> so. I'm going to have to start using that. <laughs> like, it's just like, it would make, and whenever you would do a big workshop with David, there would be new people. Like, it would always crack me up when he would do it because you would see them, like, like jump up. Because <laughs> they weren't used to it. It's like, no, dude, you were literally about to hurt yourself. That's why he was getting you to, and he was, he was across the room with another student. So he was literally telling you, stop, just come out, come out of the pose, stop right there. You know, um, and so, yeah, you should start emergency just in the middle. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Stop. Um, and, then, and then once I see everybody's okay, I'll then look, where can I go and like align somebody if they're ready, if their body's ready for that at that moment, you know, um, our, our good sport James on Sunday, like I really worked with him on Sunday because he is so much stronger than he thinks he is and he bypasses, but that's what we all do. We all, it's not just him. We all will sometimes bypass things because we don't think we can. And you need that teacher there to kind of put the fire under your ass to show you that you actually can do it. And then once that realization comes, everything starts to click. All the dominoes fall into place, um, you know, and that's and I think that I think too, Cindy, a lot of people get confused with spirituality because I think they think it's supposed to be like comfortable and like peaceful. But that doesn't come till the end. <laughs> right. And I mean, the end of the, you I have mean, to do all the deep you have to do all the deprogramming. Yep. You got to be sore. Yeah, and then when you. When you go through that process again, it's like you have to go through that blackening. All that stuff has to come up before it can clear, even before it can clarify. So yeah, 
it's like having a good, you know, I, I kind of think about it like when you have like one of those days where you just have a good cry and you're heaving. And then once you're done crying and your eyes are swollen, you feel that sense of like release that the weight just fell off of you. You know, except for that, that blackening can be a prolonged experience. There's no time limit on that. Like, and that's the unfortunate thing is, you know, some people can be in that space for a month. Some people can be that space for a week. Some people can be that space for a year before and because because spirit doesn't have spirit doesn't have really have a time if there's you're you're not going to run out of time listen you're, you're going to reincarnate after this anyway so it's not like you, you know time that you time you're immortal your spirit and so uh you know it's and that's i think sometimes in the modern day i think the ancients did that better i think the ancients were better there was a, there was a deeper understanding with the the people that this was not a comfortable thing and this was a tough thing yeah and we always want things to happen so very quickly too but if you look at nature and there's another term that they use in the alchemy and um they call it pu i mean it sounds like pu it, it's they it's putrefaction is the way that they write it putrefaction which i don't really know why but it's it's like putrefication basically right so there's that element where when something is going through the black, you know, and then there's the, 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 um, the dying process the, the, but then there's that, that part where you're like this mushy goo, <laughs> which is usually the most uncomfortable part. It's like the, the caterpillar that's sitting in its, uh, Pony. before it becomes a butterfly, it gets all mushy and ooey and gooey. Mm -hmm. And so we get, sometimes when something is really thick whatever the what was darkening our soul or darkening our spirit if it was really thick it has to go through that putrefaction and yeah. that dissolving where it's like really ooey and gooey and it feels kind of gross and it's that that liminal in between space before the clarity happens yeah. You know, and it's it's giving yourself the time and the grace to be in that space when it's happening too. I think that's an important part of the of the process that it's not maybe a, a so often talked about because you know the death is often talked about and then the rebirth is talked about. So you always hear death and rebirth. But what about that that space, that whole space in between where the death is dying and dissolving and, you know, the worms are eating away at it. And, you yeah. know, like the icky part that we, we, we even look at it. We look at it and we go, ooh, that's icky. But yeah. there's a purpose, like there's a purpose to it. Then after that, the rebirth can happen. So it's not like just death, boom, rebirth. It's like death. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what is the you have to go into the under, you have to go even deeper into the underworld before you can come back up again after death. But that's, you know, that is, it's, it's the creating of the new patterns. And it's, 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 you know, I, we always laugh because Guruji used to say, new body is making, new body is making. But my boyfriend would say, yeah, but what he would neglect to say is old body's got to break first. Well, same with yeah. your mom. Same with your mind, because the, the body is a is a is is the is the effect of the mind too. So these held thoughts, these held beliefs are become so potent in us that when they're being asked to change and crack and break and restructure, it's going to bring us into this place. It's gonna hurt the body, it's gonna be sore, it's gonna, you know, we talk a lot in Ashtanga about the yoga fever, um, which is very common, like when um when you've been practicing for a while consistently, you might have like a week where you have a low grade fever and that is called the yoga fever. And it's, it's literally your body is burning away karma and burning away old patterns. So it's not a bad thing. Now, if you've got a really high fever, that might not be the yoga fever. I'm talking about a low grade fever, right? Low grade or it might get headaches, you know, there. So even though the emotions are heavy and gooey, you also will feel physical side effects from this as well. And um, old injuries come up. That's a big one. Old injuries will start to reason. You just have to keep mo moving forward. You know, one thing too, well, when I first started with the, uh, with the Ashtanga practice, you know, I always have issue with my knees. These are like some days for salsa dancing, salsa dancing knees. So um, my knees are all like were jacked up. And when I first started the practice, I felt this urge that, okay, this is what I need to do for a I just need to do the Ashtanga practice. I didn't know why I was never attracted to Ashtanga. I mean, I was, I was an Anusara. I mean, I'm very alignment, Anusara trained. And then suddenly it just, it just almost seemed like it came out of the blue, but it was a calling from, from somewhere deeper from within me that says, 
Um, no, go do Ashtanga for a little while. <laughs> and the, the primary series honestly had every single posture that I hate because, you know, you say you're good at binds and I'm terrible at binds because I got like these short arms and I'm tight. I'm just like, I'm a tight person in general. I'm not a flexible. I, I have had to work for my flexibility. Let's put it that. So I had all these postures that I really didn't like, but, um, but my body made me get up every morning and do it. So I just kept doing it. And then my knees would hurt. They would ache. And so I had to be really careful though, you know, like I would still continue to do, especially, you know, with all the things where you have to put your legs up and like art of Padmasana kind yeah, of kind fine, of yeah. positions and my knees would hurt and then they would hurt. But um, I was listening to my body at the same time to make sure it was the right kind of pain. You know, it wasn't the kind of pain that was actually telling me you need, you need to do yeah. something different. And there is a difference. And so I just did it and it hurt, and it hurt, and it hurt for months. It didn't hurt for just like one day. It hurt for probably six, seven, eight months. And then one day they just quit hurting. Yeah. Magic. And then they <laughs> haven't hurt like that since. So I'm like, okay, but that's part of that that part of that process, you know, like yeah. all this kind of achy kind of Your stuff back. will come up to surface. And, and do you remember when I was doing, when um, I was doing, I was talking about with you a few years back and whenever I would try to go into a uh, backbends, I would get nauseous. I was just thinking that I remember For like months. Yeah. It yeah. was months. Yeah. Whenever I would go back, I'd come up, I'd say, I'm going to, I'm going to throw up. Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you had hit something. And I remember that we had a discussion. You were like, should I eat something before? Because typically we don't eat before we practice. And I, you know, I was like, you know, you just play with it and see. But it's, it's, but usually I tell people when you get not, like, you, especially in back bands, you are, there is sun. This might, like, and that's why I say literally. But eventually, it, but it lasted for a long ass time. I just remember it wasn't, it would lasted a whole entire summer, I remember. Because at first I was like, well, maybe it's just the heat. So it lasted through a whole summer and then it kept going on beyond summer. I was like, okay, so it's not just the heat. And then eventually it went away. Now it will come back maybe every now and again. And usually if it does, it's because some blood sugar or something is going on, but it just passed. It's like you almost have to just kind of keep readjusting and whatever was in there was trying to work itself out. And I will say, you say you're not flexible, guys, but I adjust Cindy all the time. And yeah, I mean, I have long gorilla arms, so that I'm a different story. But Cindy's like, that's why you can't really judge somebody. I used to like, I'm binding or not, because when I, you can twist, like your spine will twist, you know? And so it's, it's, it's very, there's, there's complexity within. So for anybody watching, like understand that the human body is complex and the human body is meticulously, your soul meticulously designed your body for whatever perceived obstacles you needed to, to address whatever, whatever karma you needed to address. And all karma is, is work. It's just your cause and your effect. But the interesting thing, I always laugh when people get nauseated with backbending because we know, especially, you know, like back in the early 2000s when they were advertising those cleanses where you could drink and you would like literally poo out seven pounds and they're like, or 20, like they would advertise like all that hell. But that's actually, there's kind of some truth to that. Like your colon will sometimes like impact and you don't even know it. And if, I hate to even talk about vanity, but let's go there. If you really want a flat stomach, here's the secret. Do a crap ton of back bends. Because you are <laughs> bending and you're you're forcing those muscles to really work, but you're also moving your colon in a way, your organs in a way they're going to force that compact stuff to break down. And so sometimes, and this is like this is common. I mean, this happens a lot. It happens to me a lot in backbending too. Some, I mean, it's it's at this point I feel like backbending. I actually really enjoy backbending now, even though I struggled for so long because I I, I push myself. You know, and I, I, same with you. Like it, you, you just keep going. You just keep putting one foot in the front of the other. You just keep bending back and just keep going. You know, and then eventually it moves through. But um, a lot of times, what the body is doing is it's taking that old compact crap basically and detoxing it. Mm. And so that's why people's stomachs get really skinny, and all of a sudden their skin looks better is because. We get used to, I think sometimes we, that's the beautiful thing about humans is that we're resilient. And so sometimes we get used to feeling bad that we don't even realize we're feeling bad until we start to feel better. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I tell, Todd tells a story about Sherat, the only person that he's ever known to actually puke in a back bend because people will feel like it, but they won't puke is Sherat. 
because he had gone to like a, a Hindu weddings for like three days and he had gone to this wedding and ate all this food. And the next day he got back and his grandfather made him do like fourth series instead of, he thought he was just going to do primary. And so he got pulled into a deep back bed and all that food just, just uh, again, <laughs> that's a I, I came close. I know that a few times. The only reason I didn't was because I had to like get composure again. <laughs> Listen, I, I will, it's hot. I have, you know, I've heard people throw up in the bathroom in India, but sometimes I think that's just deli belly. Like it's their first month there and they're just, you know, cause they're not even mm -hmm. like the guy beside me used to practice beside me. He would always go and puke around Marie Chasana A. And I think it was just <laughs> his body like adjust. Cause you haven't really bad. I mean, you've done some up dogs. So you haven't really back been. If we're an Ashtanga person, that's not a deep back then. And all Sherat, he would come back and he was this Asian kid. And all Sherat would say to him when he'd come back and he'd be like, did you clean it up? Oh, God. No, no. It, like, we're not. No like, compassion. No sympathy. We're very tough love in Ashtanga. Like, he's like, did you clean it up? There's no, like, poetry reading. There's no, like, like sure, my favorite Sherat note is when you're, like, struggling in a pose in Mysore and you're, like, trying not to bust your ass. And he walks by and he just goes, where's your mind? <laughs> right that's my favorite and, then, and the, what my son says that's not helpful that's not helpful that's like, what he says to me whenever i say something and he's like that was not helpful. helpful whatever he said <laughs> i was like i have no idea where my mind is that's why i came to india to study with you. <laughs> right that's the problem like um but no and that, but that's one thing i love about ashtanga is ashtanga because the demands of the practice are so intense on the, the physical body and the mental body, it, it doesn't, you know, one thing David also used to say is like, when things are hard, you're brought to a level of honesty within yourself that you otherwise not might not be brought to. There's a level of humility. There's a level of vulnerability and complete and other honesty with yourself. When you are sweating your ass off on your yoga mat and you're shaking, which is, typical for it because you've just been you know doing so much work and your teacher is saying i need you to do that one more time <laughs> you're brought to this sense well anger too which is kind of sometimes intentional with the teachers to kind of get that out of you um uh one of the very famous female teachers i won't say her name but i love I, she's one of my favorite humans she's a certified female teacher so one of the 17 women who are certified from india and she um, has this beautiful practice, beautiful practice. I'll tell you off camera who, who it is, Cindy. And, but she's very like almost too calm, like almost too calm, very, just not no emotion whatsoever. And Sharat in the Mysore room, who's, if you guys don't know, he's the Parma guru of the Ashtanga lineage. I always feel like people know who he is. And I realize how the people don't, he's one of the most famous yoga teachers. He's a uh, Parm guru, the head of the Ashtanga lineage. And he'll be in this Mysore room and he'll like pick on her. He like will intentionally pick on her. And I've noticed it. And I, and I asked one of our mutual friends, I was like, why does he do that? And she goes, because he's, and this is another mutual friend who's also a certified lady. And, and she goes, because he's trying to get her to show emotion. He's trying, mm -hmm. she's so even keeled that she's like I'm watching him do this for years and he obviously trusts her because she's certified and it takes a lot to be to get that you're authorized most people are just authorized but she's like she he's trying to push her to that next level to get her to mm -hmm. actually show to crack to get her to show emotion and I thought that is so interesting that is so interesting because some of us are busy too busy crying that he always walks up and he's like why cry <laughs> he's like right. what? too much <laughs> too much so um you know and so i i i, I thought that was that's you know and, and i don't know i mean what what do you think about that Cindy? when people are almost too you know we don't want in yoga we don't want to turn you into a little psychopath where you have no you know we want you to crack sometimes we want to see that rawness and that realness and that honesty you know because that that's where that's where we begin right that's where there's a good place to begin and to work with yeah, I think it's a matter of just breaking through, if that's what it is, you know, just certain coping mechanisms that are keeping you bound up, you know, or that, that are keeping you from being free or that are keeping you from, you know, letting that next phase of, of expression to come out. Because, you know, coping mechanisms and coping strategies uh, can come out in very different ways through people. And yeah. that could be one, you know, is I'm just going to 
put on this mask <laughs> of just cool, calm collectedness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe on some level, she is very cool, um, calm and everything. And, but, you know, it's uh, whether it's an authentic, I guess it's an authentic calm versus uh, a mask. Yeah. Calm. I also know this particular, and I'm not going to say her name. I know she struggled heavily with like eating disorders too. And so mm -hmm. now that you're saying that, I'm like, I, I think she, in her practice, I mean, she's got a beautiful practice. Don't get me wrong, but it's almost too controlled. It almost right. be, it, there almost needs to be some messiness to it. It's mm -hmm. almost, it's almost like that, that you're right. That, that maybe that shell of protection is still there of like, if I control what expressing I expressing itself in a different kind of way. Yeah. And it's to that point where she's been doing this all this time and maybe, you know, the, and she is a very athletic woman. So maybe Sherat's like, well, if I can trigger her emotionally, then let's get this crap. Let's, let's take this wall down so we can, we can go somewhere deeper within your own, your own psyche. I mean, she's, I, she's one of my, this person that I'm talking about, she is like absolutely one of my favorite human beings in the whole world. I, I love this person. And she's actually, as someone who's kind of a famous Ashtanga teacher, she is, I will say, like when at my first trip to India, she's one of the few very famous Ashtanga teachers that will literally go sit at, ta at a table with people who it's their first trip and be so completely humble and just like introduce herself. Like you mm -hmm. don't know who she is. Like you totally know, you know, and she's just very, very cool. She's really good friends with my friend, Chris. And, you know, so I really have a lot of respect for her. Like her heart is absolutely in the right place. And, um, mm -hmm. but it's just interesting. It's, it's, and that's, I guess that's a good point too, for people like you're, you're finished when you die. And then you got mm -hmm. a whole new journey. It's like you go from like fourth <laughs> to fifth grade and that summer break is death, you know, like, and then you, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, so there's no, there's only exploration. That's all there is, is exploration. You know, as long as you're in a body, there's going to be always be more to break down. And that is really like what I want people, you know, we're going to talk about speaking of magic and alchemy, we're going to talk about the different way the body creates energy and how that, um, correlates to your spiritual work for example when you're doing cardiovascular work the body creates energy through oxygen which is necessary and then when you're doing anaerobic work the body creates it and i glue i always say i have a hard time saying glue close it has it, it pulls from so like when we're looking at cardiovascular work aerobic work that's the cardio heart vascular system so you're bringing the intensity up so you create heat in the body sweat and then you're able to pump blood because the heart and the lungs work together. So you're pumping this blood more rapidly through the body, which is then able to go into the muscles and from a health perspective, clean out the muscles, restore the muscles, heal the muscles. But also once you get to that anaerobic work, which is more like, you know, what we do in yoga and dance a lot, where it's pulling then from the, the blood is not seeping into the, the health, the stored fat, the stored, the stored energy and pulling that up. And from a very, um, again, very vain perspective, that's why dancers and yoga people have long, lean muscles because they're doing a lot of anaerobic work. However, that stored fat or stored energy is also tied to emotional bondage and baggage. And so when we use, we turn the glucose into energy through anaerobic work, that's alchemy. That's mm -hmm. creating mm -hmm. energy and changing it from stored heavy fat to a lighter energy. It's actually take the blood is working. The blood is the manifestation of prana, right? It's the physical and pulling it up. And, um, you know, I intentionally like in the Wednesday morning classes, cause it's a little bit more uh, flexible. No, no pun intended. It's actually not as flexible as the strong. We focus more on strength, but, um, mm -hmm. I actually will intentionally, and we don't use music in Ashtanga, but I'll pick particular beats that, that will for a certain part of the class, that will instigate, I intentionally want to, inst to, to to kind of instigate a certain emotion out of the students. And when we do the talks, and we're gonna talk about this in the workshop, I will intentionally get them in a very deep burning anaerobic or isometric hold where the body is hot. We've already, they're sweaty, they're hot, they're, they're, they're usually, I can see them, their muscles shaking. And I'll have them do these talks. And as this music's playing, I will tell, I will say stuff like, did somebody piss you off? Do you feel that anger? Pull into it. Pull into it. And what I'm hoping that's doing is allowing them to visualize flipping that energy. The energy's mm -hmm. there anyway. We might as well do something good with it. Right. You know, I, my favorite thing I like to say is like, did someone disrespect you this week? 
you're not wrong. If you're feeling mm -hmm. it, let's then take that. Okay, we have something to work with. We have something mm -hmm. to work with. And you see, I see like, you know, sometimes lower belly issues, lower belly softness. Well, not softness, but like fat. That can be <laughs> issues with, I mean, let's just say what it is. That could be issues with your, with your with your lower chakras of not wanting to drop into it. Mm -hmm. But if we look at that fat as as potential energy that right. we can, as magic change, well, how exciting is that then? Mm -hmm. How exciting! We've got something to work with. How exciting is that? And that's what I that's what I really want from people. I don't want people to come into my class or your class or anybody's class with this, this idea that they have to like burn calories, you're, you're burning calories. Like that's, that's going to happen regardless. I want them to come into a class and be like, what am I going to learn about myself today? What mm -hmm. happens if I get into this posture that I hate, or I run an extra mile, I don't think I can do, or I squat a little bit lower and it's, but and it's uncomfortable. But what happens if I acknowledge that it's uncomfortable, but I decide to stay? Mm -hmm. For just one more second, for just 30 more seconds. What if I have built my running up to 45 minutes and I decide tomorrow I'm just going to go to 46? What happens? Mm -hmm. That's what I want people. I, I don't want people coming if they're just trying to look good in a bathing suit. Listen, that's going to happen anyway if you work out, right? That's just that's just the icing on the cake, right? I want people to walk away understanding that spirituality is hard, but it's also exciting, and that they are so much more than what they, you know, we talk about like also, you know, when you're talking about the change thing, like as women, like, you know, we go through puberty and then we go through this pit to stage of life and then we get to menopause and that's tough, you know, because all of a sudden you're not as strong as you were maybe, or you're not, you're going through all these changes, you're getting hot flashes, all these things are happening. But what I if I had a couple of hot flashes just sitting here with you? I don't know if you noticed. Oh no, you always look beautiful. Like move my hair i was trying to be uh, discreet of it no but the thing about this, like, how awesome is that guys okay cool interesting interesting now i got something else to work with what am i gonna learn about myself now because next life i might be a man and who knows i'm not gonna have this opportunity in a man's body so you know it's it's um are for women who are coming out you know if you're suffering from postpartum depression definitely see somebody for that because that I, that's a lot of you know but but what if like i know a lot of women that I know specifically who are very athletic, you know, and they, they have a baby and they have struggle, you know, they, they're not as active. They, they can't go, get to that place they once were. Okay. So what are we going to learn now? Like this stage, what do we, your body just birthed a human. If your body can birth a human, what else can we, what else can it do? And so that's, that's really, I want people to come into this workshop excited about getting to know you're going to meet yourself. You're going to mm -hmm. meet yourself through this work, not maybe not in one day, but I want you to start to change that perspective and, and feel, you know, I, I say a lot in class, like, especially when we're in a really hard section or people are really sweaty, like this is you being alive. Like enjoy feeling that sweat on your skin and to see if you can feel that heart beating and the, the, the blood pumping the hamstrings. Like this is you being, we spend so much time trying not to die that we forget to actually be alive. And to be in that moment of sensation in the body. And that's really, that's the real alchemy. If you can really learn to just love your body and enjoy the, this roller coaster ride that's called life, then you won. You won life. Mm -hmm. You know? And we're going to talk about like, muscle things and all that kind of stuff and how the physical, we're going to talk about the big toe, my favorite subject, the big toe, the inner thigh, like how all that works and what that does mean spiritually. So what the physical means spiritually. So hopefully when you go into your next yoga class, you can like actually be more present in your body because you, you know what you, the sensations you're looking for and what that means, not just physically, but also spiritually as well for your, yourself. Is there anything else you want to add, Cindy? Mm, I don't think so. I think we talked about a lot. I know this is my, this is my favorite subject, guys. Yeah, I covered a lot of information. 
I know. And guys, I, there's a lot I held back from because we're going we're gonna to really talk about it. So basically, I told the class this morning for anybody that it's a three hour workshop. My I have a loose template of how I always kind of make it loose in case we need to change things that day, depending on the students that are there. My goal is to do about 45 minutes in the beginning, going through the workbook, talking about these things, taking questions. And then we're going to do a 90 minute practice. Now, as I told Cindy before, I don't think we've talked about this yet while filming. The practice is nothing to be. It's going to be you're going to sweat it's going to be it's going to you're going to wake your body up but it's going to it's not going to be crazy it's not going to be like ashtanga it's going to be very basic foundational stuff um that's going to be good for anybody at any fitness level and again i don't want anybody comparing your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10 everybody is welcomed i some of my favorite students in the whole wide world have been the tightest students i'm thinking about one student in particular you know it's it's you are not going to imp- I've seen it all. Cindy's seen it all. You're not going to impress us with your, with your athletic abilities. Just be there and work hard. We just want you to impress yourself, you know? And so, and so, um, and then we'll do 90 minutes and then we'll do about 45 minutes afterwards where we get, cause sometimes in theory, this makes sense, but then in practice, it kind of falls apart. And so I wanted to give a good enough time at the end to then do Q and a and see what the students need to know and how deeper we need to go and some more deeper explanation if there's some cute confusion and all that kind of stuff. And again, this is open. It, it, you know, we're basing this in yoga and dance, but this is open to all movement. So whether you're a runner, whether you're a swimmer, whether you're a cyclist, anything that makes your body sweat, whether you're in menopause, look at that. You're, you're sweating automatically. You don't even have to do anything. Um, you know, come cause this, this is for you. This is going to be for anybody. If you have a body and you have muscles in your body, which you, you do if you have a body, then this is this is the workshop for you. And for people, again, who are coming th- from the Zoom, we will send a PDF of the wor- of the workbook for you. So, yeah, all the information is at sacredgardenyoga.com. Yeah. Yep, it's all up. So you can go on there and register for classes. Fun. I'm, I'm so excited. When you come, if you're coming, just... Make sure you wear clothes that you're able to sweat in and be comfortable to move in. And maybe don't eat right before, like right before you come, like give yourself at least an hour. What they tell us when we were kids, if you did, if you exercise, if you exercise within an hour of eating, you die. Like, didn't they like tell us that as kids? And <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's, I think it like in the yoga, they say technically, technically, if you want to be really serious about it, you don't eat two hours before moving but you're gonna have some discussion and all that in the beginning yeah yeah they'll be 45 I mean, it's not gonna be you're not gonna be running a marathon you know they actually right. uh, yeah in india they krishmacharya towards the end of his life used to practice in the afternoons and we'll talk about brahmacharya and the times of day and how it affects your body all that kind of stuff too and towards the end of his life he again he practiced in the e- in the evenings instead of in the early morning hours and somebody asked tim Thelman once oh my god can i do that and tim Thelman was like yeah, if you want to not eat all day, because he would not eat all day to make sure his belly was completely clear for that evening practice. So even though morning practice is brahmachari, so it's time of God anyway, but you're also, you know, already in the fast. Yes, you don't have to sit all day hungry Mm -hmm. your practice. (laughs) Right. I'm not please eat something in the morning, guys, make sure you fuel yourself. You know, you know, we don't want any eating disorders, make sure you fuel yourself for this. But just, you know, maybe not, maybe not 15 minutes before you come in so <laughs> so right. all right you guys well i guess if you have you can ask questions in the comment section or email me at esoteric atlanta at gmail.com or contact cindy all the website information will be there and i hope i hope that this is interesting to you and you feel inspired i really hope that you come yay thanks for having me on thanks for coming on uh, we'll talk to you guys soon bye everybody bye